we're slowly translationing a little bit into more crypto. And the first talk is going to be by Irmila Maharev, who is a PhD student here and is now a postdoc um, in New Mesh School. So, over to you. Thank you. Um, my talk is on classical verification of quantum computations. This uh, topic lies in cryptography, complexity theory, and quantum computing. So I'll try to keep it at a high enough level so that most of you can follow, but I encourage you to ask a lot of questions during the talk. Okay, so I'll start by telling you what the question is. So the way to imagine it is you have an experimentalist who has access to a quantum computer, and we think of the experimentalist as a classical being. And her goal is to verify that the quantum computer is behaving correctly in the sense that the quantum computer's behavior is consistent with our theoretical model of how quantum computers should behave. So what she does is she asks the quantum computer to perform a specific quantum circuit and will assume that the output to this quantum circuit is a single bit. It's either zero or one. So the quantum circuit will return that single bit. And the experimentalist goal is to verify that this bit is correct so that the quantum computer performed the correct quantum computation. And now I think many people have heard of this question before and you know why it's important. So I'm not going to spend much time motivating why this is important, but instead I'll just tell you how it's been studied in our community. So in our community we've looked at it through the lens of interactive proofs. And here we replace the classical experimentalist with a verifier, and the quantum computer is referred to as the prover. And now the verifier is going to interact classically with the prover over some number of rounds. And her goal is to use this added power of classical interaction in order to verify the behavior of the quantum computer. So this question was first stated by Daniel Gottesman in 2004. And since then, it's been extensively studied. And again, I'm not going to cover the previous work here with the goal of leaving some extra time for more technical content. But instead, I'll go directly into the setting in which I'm going to talk about it here. And that's with post-quantum cryptography. So in this talk, I'm going to focus on how we can address this question of classical verification of quantum computations using post-quantum crypto. So the key difficulty in this setting is that the classical verifier is much weaker than the quantum prover. There's a huge power imbalance here. And that's where post-quantum crypto can be really helpful. Because what we can do is we can use post-quantum crypto to upper bound the power of the quantum machine. So we can take advantage of the fact that the quantum machine, quantum machine is polynomial time bounded, and we can use some crypto that even the quantum machine cannot break. So this is referred to, so I'm just using classical cryptography that an efficient quantum computer cannot break. For example, one of the most commonly used candidates is learning with errors, which was introduced by Oded Begov in 2005. So, so far, all I've said is that there's a power imbalance between the classical verifier and the quantum prover, and we can address the power imbalance by upper bounding the power of the quantum prover. Unfortunately, this isn't enough because the classical verifier is still much weaker than the quantum prover. So to address the remaining imbalance, we can allow the classical machine access to a trap door, which can restore the balance in some sense. So by giving the classical machine access to a trap door, maybe the verifier can compute something that even the quantum prover cannot. And this added power turns out to be enough to allow the verifier to verify quantum computations. And now just to give you a brief example of how this might work, imagine a setting in which we could use cryptography to allow the prover to create the following state. So this is just a uniform superposition with a phase of either uh, one or negative one. And the phase is dependent on this bit r. And what we'd like is that the bit r can be computed by the verifier using the trapdoor but is computationally difficult for the prover to compute. So this is just a very rough example of how cryptography might help us. And in the rest of the talk, I'll tell you how we can actually build crypto that would allow us to do something like this and then extend it to verification. And the key point here is that the prover is holding a quantum state which is unknown to him because it's hard for him to compute that bit r, but is known to the verifier because the verifier can efficiently compute the bit r using the trapdoor. Okay, so now let me get into the cryptography that we'll need to do this. And so this cryptographic primitive is called a trapdoor clock refunction pair. And I'll first define it and show how it can be used as a test for quantumists. And then I'll show how it can be used to verify quantum computations. Okay, so this primitive was introduced by Goldwasser, Macaulay, and Rivest in 84. And it's a pair of functions f0 and f1 
which are injective and they have the same image. They're, and the, there's a property which is called the claw three property, which says that for both quantum and classical machines, it's hard to find a claw, which is a pair of pre-images x0 and x1, which map to the same image. And finally, there's a trap door, which allows for efficient inversion. So given the trap door and an image y, there's an algorithm which can output x0 and x1, which are the two pre-images of y. So what these two points are saying is, without the trap door, it's hard for both quantum and classical machines to find two pre-images which map to the same point. But with the trap door, there's an algorithm that can take as input any image and output the two pre-images which correspond to that image. Okay, now quantum computers can do something pretty interesting here. What a quantum machine can do is sample a random image Y and create a uniform superposition over the corresponding claw. And I'll tell you how this is done in a second, but for now let me just tell you why this is interesting, why it sets quantum machines apart from classical machines. And when you first look at this superposition, it might seem a little strange because I said earlier that it's hard for a quantum machine to find a claw, to find x0 and x1, but the superposition seems to contain information about both preimages. So to see why that's not a contradiction, the first thing to note is that this state has to be measured to gain information. And so let's see what happens if we measure in two different bases. If we measure in the standard basis, we'll obtain either one of the two pre-images with equal probability. That's not particularly interesting because that can easily be reproduced by a classical probability distribution. Now, if we measure this in the Hadamard basis, then we'll obtain a string D which satisfies this equation. So this is the part that seems interesting because the string D satisfies this equation which has to do with both members of the claw, both x0 and x1, even though the quantum machine itself can't find the claw. So this is something that we believe to be a uniquely quantum capability. And the way to formalize that is to see what would happen if this was possible classically. And it turns out we can rule this out because if this were possible classically, it would mean that the classical machine could essentially hold both one of the two pre-images, x0, x1, and a single bit of the other. And this is a stronger property than the claw-free property. It's called, we call it the adaptive hardcore bit property. And it says that it's hard to hold both a pre-image and a single bit of the other pre-image. And if we can prove this, then we're kind of ruling out this capability of sampling the string D for classical machines. So we have a TCF implementation from Learning with Errors. This was in joint work with Zvika Berkarski, Paul Christiana, Umesh Gargani, and Tomas Vidic. And for that implementation, we showed that this adaptive hardcore bit property, which is the strengthening of the claw free property, holds. Okay, so now that I, I showed you that a quantum machine can obtain the string D, the next thing I'll do is I'll formalize this. So I said a quantum machine can do this, a classical machine can't. So this forms a test for quantumness, and I'll formalize what it means to test for quantumness, and I'll show you how this primitive can be used to test for quantumness. But before that, let me just fill in a detail that I skipped over, which is how this superposition can be created. Okay, so we want a quantum machine to create this superposition. And what the quantum machine does is he first creates a uniform superposition over the bit B and the string X, which is the domain of the function. <coughs> then he applies either F0 or F1, depending on that first bit B. And now he measures that last register to obtain an image y. And at this point, due to the entanglement in the state, the state collapses to that state on the first line. There are two pre-images of y, x0 and x1, so the state collapses. And this is a pretty easy thing for a quantum machine to do. So this is how the quantum machine samples a random image y along with a superposition over the claw. Okay, so now I can go into the test for quantumness, but before that, are there any questions about the TCF so far? So the test for quantumness, it's a test between a classical machine and another machine that's claiming to be quantum. And the guarantee for this test should be that if the machine passes, either it's a classical machine, which takes an exponentially long time, or it's a quantum machine. And if we can build such a test, then it would serve as a protocol for verifiable quantum supremacy. Because it's proving
proving that a machine is quantum and it's also efficiently classically verified. So now I can build this test for quantumness using a TCF pair. And here's how it goes. The verifier first selects a TCF pair, F0, F1. He hangs on to the trapdoor and sends over the public description of the function to the prover. The prover responds with an image Y, which an honest machine should do by sampling a random image Y while creating a uniform superposition over a claw. Once the verifier receives Y, the verifier asks for either a pre-image Y or a string D, which satisfies this, this equation. <coughs> the verifier can then check if the prover passes by using the trapdoor. So the verifier can use the trapdoor to look at Y, extract X0 and X1, and then check that the string D satisfies that equation. Now, from what I've told you so far, it's very easy for a quantum machine to pass the test. Because a quantum machine can create this uniform superposition, and then if the verifier asks for a pre-image, he can measure the state in the standard basis. If the verifier asks for a string D, he can measure the state in the Hadamard basis. But the point of this was to separate quantum from classical. So we know it's easy for quantum, but why is it hard for classical? Now, what would happen is if a classical machine could pass the test, we could rewind the classical, classical machine and run him on both a pre-image test and an equation test. And if you do that, then he'll hold both either x0 or x1 and a string D which satisfies this equation, which means he's learning a single bit of the other pre-image and therefore violating the adaptive hardcore bit. So what this says is that it's computationally difficult for a classical machine to pass the test. If he passes the test, he's breaking learning with errors. But a quantum, for a quantum machine, it's very easy. And why is that? It's essentially because we can't use the same proof strategy for quantum machines. Quantum machines cannot be rewound. Once the quantum machine passes the pre-image test, he's collapsed his state. And now he can't use the same state to pass the, to produce a string D. Now this protocol has several implications. The first is what I mentioned earlier. If a machine can perform both tasks, it cannot be classical which gives a protocol for verifiable quantum supremacy. <coughs> the second is that if a machine can perform both tasks, it cannot be deterministic. Because if it were a deterministic machine, we could extract both a pre-image and an equation out of it, and again, violate the adaptive hardcore bit. So this gives us a protocol for certified randomness generation. Because we know that if a machine is passing both of these tasks, he's generating randomness. This structure, this TCF structure, is also very useful for homomorphic encryption. And the homomorphic encryption I'm referring to is using classical homomorphic encryption schemes to evaluate quantum circuits. Hey, sorry, can I yeah. Ask the previous paragraph that you just said, uh -huh. I didn't follow the reasoning that you got randomness out. So you said it, it can't be deterministic. Yeah. And then, and then. Yeah. Okay, so it can't be deterministic, and then what? Well, if it's not deterministic, then he must be producing randomness. This is randomness that you can somehow certify. Because you can certify whether the machine is passing these tests or not using the trap door. But you also feed in a random variable. Mm -hmm. So yeah, what you have to prove is that you're generating more randomness than you're feeding. So does it take it does take some work or it's I mean Yeah, it takes it takes a lot of work. What kinds of things go into that work? You um you have to make sure that you're putting in less randomness than you're getting out. So you see the same one as the previous randomness expansion protocol, is like the one that I was mentioning earlier. Yeah. Is it a lot of randomness that it generates, or is it just uh, a constant amount? the ratio for how much we're putting in to how much we're getting out. The ratio? Yeah.
Okay, so yeah, this structure is also useful for homomorphic encryption. I'll say a little bit more about that later, but not too much. And the final thing that this is useful for is this um, classical verification of quantum computations. So, so far what I've shown you is that we can use cryptography to create a task which separates quantum and classical machines. The next thing I'll show you is how the same cryptography, the same TCF pair, can be used to force classical commitment to quantum states. So I'll define what that means and then I'll show you how TCF pairs can be used for that. But before that, let me just briefly tell you how TCF pairs are constructed from learning with errors. And if this is unfamiliar to you, you can ignore the next two slides and I won't get back to learning with errors after that. Okay, so for the TCF construction from learning with errors, the, an LWE instance defines a TCF pair, F0 and F1. And here's what the TCF pair looks like. F0 is approximately just, um, it's the matrix A multiplied by the input. And F1 is almost the same thing, but it's shifted by the LWE sample. And I say approximately because both of these functions will be probabilistic functions. So both of them will be this lattice point perturbed by some error, and that's what makes them overlap. So as long as we set the error appropriately, the images of these two functions will be statistically close. And the trapdoor is easy, it's just the lattice trapdoor of A. The claw-free property is also pretty straightforward because what the claws look like, a claw x0 and x1 has the form that x1 equals x0 minus s. So finding a claw x0 and x1 implies finding the LWE secret and breaking the LWE, breaking LWE. And the adaptive hardcore bit is a bit trickier. What it says is that for all non-zero strings, it should be hard to guess that bit, the inner product of D and S. And for people in crypto, this might seem straightforward because there are various techniques in cryptography, like leakage resilience for learning with errors, which address this question. Unfortunately, it is a bit more difficult because the string D is chosen adaptively. So the string D is chosen after the function A, A, S plus E is given. And that makes it trickier and we can't just use um, leakage resilience techniques immediately. Okay, so that's all, all I'll say about this function, but one more um, side note is, earlier I said that this structure is also used for homomorphic encryption. So it's used for using classical homomorphic encryption schemes to evaluate quantum circuits. And what I meant there was that if a, homo if a classical homomorphic encryption scheme has a TCF structure, in the sense that I just showed that LWE has a TCF structure, then this classical homomorphic encryption scheme can be immediately used to evaluate quantum circuits. And luckily, there are quite a few uh, classical homomorphic encryption schemes which are essentially exactly LWE. So we can directly use these schemes to evaluate quantum circuits homomorphically. Okay, so this is all I'm gonna say about learning with errors and more of the cryptography. And now I'm gonna go back to this classical commitment. Yeah. Uh, maybe a simplistic question. Um, you, you used a, a shift there, I, and I guess, a shift operator, I guess you, that's because you wanted to use it for the, fully, for the homomorphic encryption or computation, but um, could you also have used learning parity with noise instead of? Actually, learning parity with noise is really interesting because if we can get learning parity with noise to work, meaning if we can build a TCF out of it, yeah. then it seems like we can get quantum computers to break learning parity with noise, which means that it, sh it shouldn't work. Right. We shouldn't be able to set the parameters of learning parity with noise to build a TCF. How would you prove that? Because, okay, so what happens here is um, you get this superposition, and it's x0 plus x1, which is x0 minus s. And when you sample a string D in the Hadamard basis, it satisfies this equation. D dot x0, xor, x0 minus s equals zero. Now, if these two canceled, you'd be in trouble because then you'd get a bunch of equations with respect to D dot s. And if this is done mod q, which is what we're doing here, they don't cancel. There's this mod q versus mod two. If you did learning parity with noise, everything would be mod two. These would cancel. Now you get equations with respect to s. 
also mean that you can show that you, so learning parity with noise was interesting because there's an exponential gap between the noisy classical computation and the noisy quantum computation. Mm -hmm. uh, does this mean that you, you also have a similar gap with your version of learning with errors? Again, we still believe it's uh, exponentially hard even for quantum. We don't know sub exponential quantum algorithms. But yeah. Oh, no, I'm interested in gap in the presence of noise uh, for n noisy. Remember, this is the IBM paper from John Small and then Andrew Cross and Graham Smith. But they require a superposition uh, of your training data. So in this case, it's different. You don't, you don't have that. So if it was over, uh, like, instead of bits, it like over uh, Z3, uh -huh. would, would that still be dangerous, or um, that potentially could still? I think that could potentially still be okay because you wouldn't get cancellation. That's the the key problem is if these cancel and you get equations with respect to S. Yeah. As far as you know, it could still. Well, I think that would run into issues later because we need Q to be sufficiently large to get the right error parameters and to get the adaptive heart for it. So it wouldn't run into this immediate issue, but maybe later on. Yeah. So, it seems like all you're saying is that uh, if you can build a PCF from LPM, yeah. where the two preimages are X0 and X0 XOR uh -huh. uh, with a fixed S, then yes. but yeah. you could have a, a completely sure. different. Yeah, it could look totally different. But if we just fit it into this framework, then right. yes, right. I agree. Any more questions about the TCF or the crypto aspects before I move on to commitment? Okay, so the rest of this talk, I'm going to focus on this primitive called <laughs> classical commitment to quantum states, which I can build from TCF pairs. So I'll start by defining what this primitive looks like. Here's the ideal behavior. This primitive is, it's a protocol between a classical verifier and a quantum prover. The quantum prover has a single qubit state psi in his mind, and he'd like to commit to it, which he does using a TCF, and the commitment is just a classical string Y, which he sends to the verifier. The verifier will select a measurement basis, either Hadamard or standard, and ask the prover for the measurement of his committed state in the desired basis. The guarantee of this protocol should be that when the prover reports the measurement to the verifier, it must be the measurement of his committed state in the basis chosen by the verifier. So this is a pretty powerful guarantee because what it's saying is that the prover is just sending a classical string, but this is tying his hand so that once the verifier asks for a measurement, he has committed to a fixed quantum state. He cannot change his mind once the verifier asks for a measurement result. So it's enforcing non-adaptivity on the part of the prover. Now to, to try to emphasize why this protocol is, is so strong, um, I'll tell you what this looks like with multiple qubits. And now the protocol is quite similar. There are a few differences. So now the prover is committing to an n qubit state, which means that his commitment string y is now going to be a concatenation of n commitment strings because he's going to commit to each qubit individually. The next difference is that the verifier chooses a measurement basis, either Hadamard or standard, for each of the qubits. So the verifier's basis choice can now be one of two to the n different strings. And so what this is saying is that this single classical string sent by the prover serves as a commitment to an exponentially complex quantum state. So just sending one classical string ties the prover's hands to exponentially many different basis choices on the verifier. He's tied to one quantum state. Okay, so Hopefully you understand that this commitment protocol is quite powerful, but just to wrap this up, I'll tie this commitment protocol to verifiability, and then I'll go back and I'll tell you how to build the commitment protocol using trapdoor claw free function pairs. Yeah? So uh, if that qubit that you're setting psi that you're committing to yeah. were a classical bit, uh -huh. that would be classical bit commitment, mm -hmm. which wouldn't work out. So um, it seems like there are Part, uh, some of the quantum 
there's a subspace you're being committed to, but not all possible things. Is that Sorry, right? if it's a classical bit commitment, why wouldn't it work out? Uh, my understanding <coughs> is that classical bit commitment cannot work out. With computational assumptions? Oh, you have yeah. computational assumptions. Yeah. 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 Fine. <laughs> <laughs> That's cheating. <laughs> yeah. OK. okay. So I missed that totally. Yeah. So with computational assumptions. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, okay. well, I was being hopeful. <laughs> OK. So a link, um, a link commitment to verifiability, and then I'll construct the commitment protocol. And then the final step will be to describe why the commitment protocol is secure, so why it satisfies this non-adaptivity guarantee when you have it To link to verification, I'll try to highlight it in two steps, and then I'll go into the details of these two steps. So the first thing to note, um, this came up in Henry's talk, is that a quantum state serves a, serves as a certificate for the solution to a quantum computation. So Henry referred to this as a history state. The next thing to note, which also came up in Henry's talk, was that this quantum state can be verified by measuring it. So putting these two together, we can pretty much link this commitment protocol immediately to verification. But let me go in and fill in the details. And to do that, I'll look at classical computation for a second. If we wanted to verify an efficient classical computation, one way to do that is to convert the computation to a 3SAT formula and then verify that the 3SAT formula is satisfiable. And that's pretty easy. All the verifier has to do is ask for a satisfying assignment and verify that the formula is satisfied. Now, in the classical, in the quantum world, we can draw a direct analogy. Here, 3 sat corresponds to local Hamiltonian. An n-bit variable assignment corresponds to an n-qubit quantum state. And the number of unsatisfied clauses of the formula with respect to the assignment corresponds to the energy of the quantum state with respect to the Hamiltonian. So this analogy lets us come up with a verification protocol with a quantum verifier. So what a quantum verifier can do is verify that a local Hamiltonian H has low energy. And to do this, the verifier just asks the prover for a ground state and verifies that the state has low energy. And this is quantum because to estimate the energy, the quantum verifier has to perform Hadamard and standard basis measurements. That's all he has to do. That's the only quantum aspect of the protocol. So all he has to do is ask for a quantum state perform Hadamard in standard basis measurements, and then do some classical post-processing on those results, and he's done. OK, so given this setup, all a classical verifier needs to do is take the work of the quantum verifier, which was taking the state and measuring it, and force the prover to do it. So the classical verifier needs to force the quantum prover to non-adaptively perform the measurements. And this is exactly what the measurement protocol does. So the measurement protocol forces the prover to commit to a quantum state and then measure that state in the basis desired by the verifier. Yeah? Do you really want to say that strongly? Is this uh, necessary or sufficient? It's sufficient. Necessary for what? For verification in general? The word needs there. And I, I'm wondering if it isn't just sufficient. If I'm going this route where I want a classical verifier to get a prover to do his work for him for this specific setup, yeah. then yes. Is necessary, but there are many other ways you could try to get classical verification. Okay. Are there any other questions about this aspect? Because from here on out, I'm not going to talk about verification. I'll just talk about commitment. Okay. So I can continue to the commitment protocol. And for the rest of this talk, I'm not going to focus on the n-qubit commitment protocol. I'll, I'll focus on the single-qubit commitment protocol, just for simplicity. And to remind you of how it goes, the prover commits to a single-qubit quantum state with a classical term using a trapdoor clock free function. The verifier chooses a measurement basis, either Hadamard or standard. And the prover should be forced to measure the committed state in the desired basis as long as he cannot break the trapdoor clock free function. So now let's go through this step by step, and I'll show you how these are done. How these steps are done with a trapdoor clock free function. So let's say that this is the state that the prover wants to commit to, and how he commits to it using a TCF is by sampling a random image y, and entangling his state with the corresponding clock. And that's done exactly as I said before. So he takes his single qubit state, and he appends to it a uniform superposition over the domain. 
And then he applies the TCF pair in superposition, and he measures that last register to obtain Y. So the classical commitment will just be that image Y. And now he's entangled his state so that it's entangled with a claw instead of just a single key. Okay, and then, so what I've said so far is that so far, all the commitment protocol is, is the verifier sending over a TCF pair, the prover entangling his state that he wants to commit with the claw and sending over the image Y to the verifier. Now, remember the goal was that the prover should not be able to change his state prior to measurement. So once he's committed to his state, if the verifier asks him for a measurement result, he has to measure that committed state. I'll try to give you some intuition for why that should hold. And roughly, you can imagine that if the prover didn't have access to that second register containing x0 or x1, then he wouldn't really have power to change his state. Because this is this large entangled state, and he only has access to that first qubit. So he can't really change his state much. And roughly, that's what's going on here, because the prover doesn't know x0 and x1 due to the claw-free property. So the prover has this large state, but since he doesn't know what most of the state looks like, he can't really change the state once the verifier asks for a measurement. Now, this is a bit too strong because what I've said so far is that this entanglement with a claw essentially prevents the prover from altering his state. But I do need the prover to be able to alter the state if the verifier asks for a measurement. So for example, if the verifier asks for a Hadamard measurement, the prover should be able to perform a Hadamard on the state and send the result back. And it turns out that the prover can do that and the reason is that even though the prover doesn't fully understand his state, the verifier does. So the verifier has the trapdoor, and he can use the trapdoor to extract x0 and x1. Now he knows something about the prover state that the prover does not know, and he can help the prover in performing measurements. So what this means is that if the verifier wants the prover to do something, the verifier can help him. But if the verifier doesn't want the prover to do something, then the prover has no power on his own because he doesn't understand his own quantum state. So now what I'll do is I'll spend some time on this last bullet point to tell you how the verifier can help the prover to perform these measurements. And then to wrap up the talk, I'll go back to the second and third bullet points and show you how to prove those two. Um, before I go into this last bullet point, are there any questions? How do yeah. you understand this protocol when you purify it? Because that's usually what I mm -hmm. want to do in order to remove all holes from an argument. Mm -hmm. You mean if I'm dealing with a much larger entangled state? Yeah, it, it, so you have classical things and quantum things, and because they're in different universes, it makes it uh, hard to understand all the possible holes. Yeah. Um, is there a simple way to see what you've done if I purified everything so that everything were just quantum? Yeah, so that is what I've done. So I've taken the whole prover space and just written it as a very large quantum state. Oh, no, you, you have some uh, intermediate measurements along the way. I yeah. Think all out to the ends. Um, okay, so I'll get more into that in the soundness protocol. So what I do is that I move everything to the end except the measurement of y. The measurement of y matters, and I look at the state after the measurement of y, and everything else is moved to the end. Okay, I'll so, wait. Okay, yeah, so the state that I'm analyzing is the state post-measurement of y. Okay. So, okay, now I'll focus on this last bullet point of how the verifier can help the prover perform measurements. And I'm going to focus on the Hadamard basis measurement. Now, the honest prover has a single qubit quantum state, and his goal is to just apply the Hadamard to his state and measure. So he has a single qubit state that he wants to commit to, and eventually he's going to want to do a Hadamard measurement and report it. Now, the problem is that once the prover commits to his state, he doesn't have that single qubit anymore. He has this much larger quantum state. And now that he has this much larger quantum state, he can't just perform the Hadamard on it. It won't make sense. So it turns out that what he can do instead is he can take this much larger state and convert it into something else. So he can convert it back into a single qubit, which has almost the form of the top line, which is the ideal solution, but it's off by this bit flip. So for those of you who might not remember, this x operator is just the Pauli bit flip. So if r is equal to 1, it flips the registers. And if r is equal to 0, it does nothing. And now the point is, r is unknown to the prover. So to the prover, this state doesn't look like anything. 
but R can be computed using the trapdoor, so the verifier does know R. So what this means is that the prover can compute almost the ideal thing up to something that the verifier can remove. Now to put all of this together, what this looks like is when the prover wants to perform a Hadamard measurement, the prover applies a Hadamard transform to this entire committed state. The result of that is this state. So previously what I referred to as the bit R is now this string D in the, with the inner product with x0, x0, x1. And now the prover can just measure this state, hand it back to the verifier, and the verifier can decode the measurement result by XORing it with this inner product. The verifier can compute that because the verifier knows the trapdoor. So this is the protocol with the honest prover. The prover has this committed state, he measures everything in the Hadamard basis, and the verifier decodes the final measurement result to obtain the Hadamard measurement result of the single qubit. Yeah? Do you have any friendly random value? Or? For an honest prover, D is uniformly random. So this is, the, this is the commitment protocol so far. The verifier sends over a TCF pair. The prover commits and reports an image Y. Then the verifier can ask him to perform a Hadamard measurement. And I showed you how that's done. I didn't say anything about the standard basis. And the standard basis is relatively straightforward compared to the Hadamard basis. That's roughly because, so first of all, standard basis measurement is easy here. Because he can just measure the state and he'll either get 0, x0 or 1, x1. And the reason that it's um, non-adaptive is because if the prover can alter the standard basis distribution, it essentially means he can map x0 to x1 or x1 to x0. Now, this is, the intuition is straightforward, but to make, to make it entirely non-adaptive for multiple qubits, I do require another cryptographic primitive, which I'm not going to get into in this talk. For the rest of this talk, I'll just focus on the security of the Hadamard basis. So I showed you how it was done for an honest prover, but now I need to tell you why it's true for a cheating prover. So for an arbitrary prover, how can I argue that he has committed to a quantum state, and when he's asked for a measurement result, he reports the measurement result as requested? Yeah? What do you mean by the prover can alter the distribution? So, okay, the, in the standard basis, what he should report is zero with probability alpha zero squared and one with probability alpha one squared. So let's imagine he can alter that. And instead, once it's entangled, he can report zero with probability alpha zero prime squared and one with probability alpha one prime squared. And what that means, if he can take this and map it to alpha zero prime or alpha one prime, that means he essentially has a unitary which can map x zero to x one. So now we have to um, prove the security of the Hadamard basis. And this is what I refer to as the soundness of the commitment protocol. So it's showing non-adaptivity on the part of the prover. Now this is, this is probably the hardest part of the protocol because it's quite tricky to enforce structure for a quantum prover. So a quantum prover can have a very large Hilbert space and we have no idea what the prover is doing with this space. And what we need to do is use cryptography to enforce structure on the prover's space, to say that the prover must be applying the operations we're telling him to apply. So, for example, the first issue that comes up is that how do we even know that the prover has a committed state? Because I keep referring to the prover creating a quantum state and committing to it, but for all I know, the prover could be working with classical distributions and then just generating an image Y from some classical distribution. So that's the first hurdle, and the way to get over this is by adding an extra component to the protocol, which is called a test round. And in the test round, the verifier randomly asks the prover for a pre-image of Y after the prover commits. So after the prover reports Y, the verifier will sometimes just ask the prover to report a pre-image of Y. Now, if the prover was honest, so if he actually committed to this quantum state, this is very easy. He can just measure his state in the standard basis, and he'll obtain a pre-image. But what if he didn't? So what if he didn't have a committed state in mind? Then what this test does is it creates structure. Because what it tells us is that at some point in time, somewhere in the prover's space, there was a pre-image. 
And we know that because the prover must have measured some part of his space to obtain a preamid. So what that means is we can look at the entire prover space and write it down like this. So this might look complicated, but all it's saying is that at some point in time, there was some preimage in a register held by the prover. So this psi just represents the extra space of the prover. But all you should really notice here is now we have a state which has the preimages of y. <coughs> so this is, the, this is the first step, and it's probably the most important step because it's giving us some structure. And from here on out, we can work with the structure because now we have defined a committed state. So this is the committed state. It's a superposition over preimages. And now we just need to argue that he's behaving correctly on this committed state. Correct. Yeah? So you always do this. You, uh, the, the protocol always uh, has uh, asked the prover to, because you say you test the prover randomly. Yeah. I, I'm, not, I'm not clear what you mean. Do you always do it, or you just do it with probability? With probability, like one half yield estimate. But then you only get this state with probability. No, because then you can make the claim that if the prover passes perfectly, so you model a prover and you know that the prover has some probability of passing a test round. So the first thing you say is if he passes perfectly, then I can write his state in this form. If he doesn't pass perfectly, he has some trace distance from the perfect prover. I'm a little worried about that because you're trying to use a, a single round logic on a multi-round protocol. <coughs> I'm worried about entanglement between the rounds of the protocol. Yeah, that is an issue. And the reason, okay, so first of all, the commitment is indivisible. So each qubit is committed to with independent keys. But, but let's say the prover only wants to uh, um, skip out once in, a, in many, many commitments. Yeah. So can you? Um, prevent, prevent that from happening? I can't prevent it from happening, but he's going to have some trace distance from the ideal prover. And then that'll impact the soundness in some way. Right, but that yeah. might be epsilonically big enough to allow the prover to uh, falsify one commitment. Yeah, okay, so what you do is eventually, like any of these statements, remember we had, so what this will eventually link to is a quantum state for this um, quantum verification procedure. So anything that he does, can be, I can use it to construct a quantum state, which, yeah. I get that yeah. part, yeah. So maybe I'm not understanding. No, no, yeah. I, I, it, I, I'm using, I'm trying to apply the same logic and criteria that led to all the holes for quantum key distribution, where the criteria there that's desired is that the, um, the eavesdropper does not even get a single bit of the key. And I guess the analog here would be the prover uh, not being able to cheat a single uh, round in a many round protocol. Yeah, but see, I'm, I'm not going for a very strong guarantee. I'm going for verification. Right. So for example, for the certified randomness gener generation protocol, the guarantees that I'm getting here aren't strong enough. It's just a different setting. So I think that might be the case with key distribution as well. Good, that's yeah. very good, okay. So this defines a committed state. And now the next step is to actually say what the prover is doing with the committed state. So the goal is to show that when the prover is asked to measure the committed state in a Hadamard basis, he does that. Now, the most general thing that the quantum prover could do is instead of measuring in the Hadamard basis, he could apply an arbitrary unitary operator to the state. And then he could measure in the Hadamard basis. And the reason I can assume this is because unitary operators are reversible. So I can always assume he does whatever he wants, and then at the end, he does the correct thing. So in general, the prover could apply an arbitrary unitary and then measure in the Hadamard basis. And then the verifier will receive that result and then decode by this uh, bit having to do with the clock. Now what happens is that this is the intuition I gave earlier. The unitary U is essentially acting blindly because the unitary U is acting on this state but that unitary U is chosen by the prover who doesn't know what the state looks like. And the fact that the unitary is acting blindly is what really restricts the power of the unitary. So what it says is that the unitary U is essentially, it's computationally randomized by both this initial state and the verifier's decoding. And what this means is that the U, the operator U is so limited that the prover may as well have committed to a different state and then perform the measurement results honestly. Um, in a multi-round protocol, 
doesn't uh, the prover start to get some information about the x and x0 and x1 if you don't switch TCFs each time? So first of all, this is only two rounds. So he reports y, and the verifier says, give me a measurement, and that's it. Uh, but you have this random uh, thing happening. So you, there are many rounds happening so that you can you utilize that randomness, right? You can do it all in parallel because you can have a very... Exactly. Yeah. So if you do it in parallel, then the, the prover can also entangle many unitaries between those uh, different rounds happening in okay. parallel. Yeah, that's, that's true. That's, that's where, uh, so the unitary doesn't have to act on a single... Yes. And <laughs> yeah. I'm worried about this claim. Yes. Yeah, that's a good reason to be worried. I'll tell you why it's okay. Okay. Okay, so. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. So this is the way to handle it. Um, so the technique that I'll be using is called the Pally Twirl. This is a technique that is very useful in the information theoretic setting. So I'll just briefly tell you how it's used in the information theoretic setting, and then I'll switch back to the computational setting. And let me just remind you what the Pally operators are in the single qubit setting. The Z is a phase operator, so it inserts a phase of negative one, and X is a bit flip operator. And the key fact that I need is that the Pauli operators form a basis. So what that means is a unitary operator acting on a single qubit can be written as a linear combination over single qubit Pauli operators. And what the Pauli twirl refers to is the operation of conjugating a unitary U by a randomly chosen Pauli matrix. And this so this conjugation creates a new randomized operator. And the randomized operator is very different, and it's much weaker than the original unitary u. So what the randomized operator does is it applies each Pauli operator with, pro with the probability corresponding to the coefficient in this linear combination. So what it does is it breaks down a general unitary into just a probability distribution over Pauli operators, which is much weaker than a general unitary. So this Pauli twirl is very useful in the information theoretic setting for interactive proofs because in that setting, what was often the case was that the prover could apply a general unitary U to a quantum state, but usually his unitary U would act on this quantum state which had a random Pauli applied to it. And what that meant was that his general unitary may as well have been a Pauli operator rather than a unitary operator. So it's really restricting the power of a general quantum prover. It's saying instead of thinking that a general quantum prover can apply a general a unitary, he's just applying a Pauli. And that means in that setting, we just had to create interactive proofs which could guard against cheating Pauli operators rather than general unitary operators. So this was a pretty powerful technique in the information theoretic setting because it really restricted the power of a quantum prover and it let us characterize the power of the quantum prover and say that he's only acting with Pauli operators and not unitaries, not general unitaries. And here, I'll use it for something similar, but it's slightly weaker. Now, in this setting, there is randomness present in the state, but it's not as powerful as the Pauli twirl because it's not information theoretic randomness and it doesn't constitute a full Pauli operator. So what happens is that the unitary U that the prover applies to this state is conjugated by a computationally random Z operator. So this Z operator comes from two places. The first place comes from the verifier's decoding. So the verifier's decoding has to do with the claw, X0 and X1. And so that looks computationally random to the prover. The second Z operator prior to U comes from this state, which also has X0 and X1 in it. And so this, both of these operators randomize the unitary U. Now, I told you that the prover's deviation operator is conjugated by a computationally random Pauli Z operator. But before that, I just told you what happens if we conjugate a unitary by a uniformly random Pauli. And this is weaker because now we're just dealing with Z operators rather than both Z and X operators. And what happens here is that we can't cut down the unitary U to a distribution over Paulis, but instead we can cut it down to an operator U prime which commutes with standard basis measurement. And this turns out to be exactly enough for this setting because now we can assume that any general prover, instead of applying an operator U, an arbitrary operator U, he applies an operator U prime which commutes with standard basis measurement. 
This allows us to define a new committed state, which is the original committed state, but it has this attack u prime applied to it. And now, the nice thing about this state is that I know that this state is measured honestly. Because for the Hadamard basis, I know that the prover just applies his attack and measures in the Hadamard basis. So if you look at this committed state, when the prover is asked to do a Hadamard transform, he's just applying a Hadamard transform honestly. And for the standard basis, it's consistent with the standard basis from the previous committed state because u prime commutes with standard basis measurement. So this defines a new committed state for which the prover measures the state honestly, and that's satisfying the guarantee of the commitment protocol, which means, says that the prover commits to a state and then measures it honestly. Yeah? So let's see, the, the random z just makes u a classical random function. Is the, am I correct about that? No, it's not a classical function. It's still quantum. Um, but it's just x operations. It's x operations, but they also have, there are still z operators there. That's true. Yeah, so you still have cross terms. It's not a neat thing. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, and then the second question is, these Zs are not being uh, explicitly thrown in. They're just arising from the TCF that was yes. used. And so it seems to me that there's something circular, because if you do have a parallel set of protocols <laughs> going on, the prover could uh, learn something about the x zeros and x1s. Mm -hmm prover will know something about the Zs that are happening, and mm -hmm. therefore they're not twirling anymore. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's true. And so to avoid that, I do have to use independent keys for each commitment. OK. So that's like choosing random TCFs in many ways. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That, that is something I don't know how to get around. I don't know how to use the same key for each. Yeah. Any more questions on the soundness? So to wrap up, um, the question that I've addressed is whether quantum computations can be verified classically. And this protocol relied on a primitive called classical commitment to quantum states. The ideal functionality of this primitive is as follows. The prover should construct a quantum state of his choice. The verifier will choose a measurement basis. And the prover should report the measurement results of his committed state in the basis desired by the verifier. The prover first commits to his quantum state using trapdoor claw free functions. And then, due to the claw free property, we know that the prover is forced to measure the committed state in the basis desired by the verifier. So, putting all of this together, this says that verifiable delegation of quantum computations is possible with a classical machine, assuming the quantum security of learning with errors. That's all. Thank you. Time for a few more questions. Could you explain why is it an easy task to prepare the report for the Uh Well, even if it's large, like let's say it's n bit strings, then you just start in the state of all zeros and do a Hadamard transform on each qubit. And now you have a new On that last uh, uh, thread we were on, so you choose random TCFs. How, how easy is it to get enough random TCFs? Uh, because it seems to me like uh, the number of random TCFs you might need for the protocol to be secure might grow faster since you then have to get larger uh, TCF domains. Does that make sense? No. no? I don't know how hard it is to find TCFs. Maybe that's the underlying question. Well, a TCF here, the one that I'm using, is just defined by a learning with error sample. Oh, oh that's right. Yeah. So it's easy. Yeah. No, the A's. The A's. I can use the same A, but I just have to sample a different secret F. So the TCF is defined by A and AS plus E. But then you might, that, then you have an underlying pattern in the A's that the prover might start to discover. Well, it's not, we're not so concerned about the A, remember, because the A is public. What hides the claw is the secret S. The S, yes. Yeah. So that's the part that needs to change over time. Um, I actually missed the reason why you don't do the full power twirl. Because uh, I can't. There's not enough. Because this, 
the randomness is coming from the trapped or claw-free function, so it's already present in the state. And I just don't have enough randomness for the full points row. Th those were in previous protocols where the quantum verifier could encode the state. And here, the state is essentially being encoded by the cryptography. So I'm just taking it as a given. 